Hey, biology students. We're starting a new lecture unit this week on viruses. Viruses, these tiny little nanoparticles that are not even cells. Boy, they cause a lot of damage. Take a look at the virus on the screen. Do you recognize it? No? Do you recognize him now? Of course. Boy, he's causing a lot of damage and disrupting the world and disrupting the economy and disrupting human health. Yes, of course we all know this is coronavirus. This is the virus that will make history for the current pandemic. So we'll talk more about our good friend coronavirus in a future lecture video with more details about him. But in this particular video, we're gonna start with an introduction to viruses. So what do we, how do we classify viruses as biologists? Well, the majority of biologists agree that a virus should not even be considered alive. That is because it does not meet the criteria of being al alive by the definition we use in biology. It does not, um, it does not, con it is not a cell. And although it does contain nucleic acid, it is unable to replicate itself without a cell. So we classify them as non-living, and they're very small, much smaller than cells, ranging from about 10 nanometers to 300 nanometers, approximately. That means you need a very specialized microscope to see these. We don't see them in our classroom laboratories because our microscopes are designed to see bacteria as the smallest organism. And viruses are about a thousand times smaller than a bacteria. Now you remember seeing bacteria under the microscope, don't you? Remember those early days of staining them um, and seeing these little tiny little spots almost look like dust under the microscope. And there they were, the bacteria. Well, we were seeing them at about, uh, about half a micrometer to about one micrometer. So imagine something a thousand times smaller than that. Now we're talking viruses. So because they require a host cell for replication, this is why they fail the criteria of being considered a living organism. So we consider them to be obligate intracellular pathogens. What that means is that they require an intracellular state in order to reproduce. I like to think of them as how they hijack, so they're hijackers of host cells, and they tell the host cell to replicate the virus or become a viral cloning factory. So what is a virus made out of if it's not a cell? Well, it's made of parts that are similar to cells. So all viruses have, at minimum, a genetic core, and the genetic core is either DNA or RNA, but never both. This is surrounded by a protein coating called the capsid. Now I want to tell you of the different combi uh, combinations we can get in that genetic core for the virus. So it's possible for the virus to have what are we called? Double-stranded DNA. We're going to write that as DS DNA. Double-stranded DNA, which is, by the way, your cell's uh, configuration of DNA, right? So we have double-stranded DNA in multiple linear chromosomes, okay? So it's possible that the viral DNA mimics the host cell's uh, structure and is double-stranded DNA. It's also possible that it's single-stranded DNA. We write that as SSDNA, single-stranded DNA viruses. That is not like our cell. Our cell does not have single-stranded DNA. 
then there are there's the RNA. So it's possible for the virus to exist as single-stranded RNA, and that is in some cases similar to our cell. Remember, our cells make messenger RNA, which is a single-stranded RNA. But Another unique configuration of the virus is a double-stranded RNA configuration. And our cells do not ever show up with double-stranded RNA. So you can already see that there are some key differences in genetic structure between viral genetic cores and the, um, the nuclear DNA of, of cells. So, this genetic core, which is one of these uh, one of these four varieties, although it gets a little more complex with the single-stranded RNA viruses, because there's actually two different types of single-stranded RNA virus. But more on that when we cover the RNA viruses in the lecture video. Okay, so um, consider one of these four combinations of genetic core. Um, protected by a protein coating. This reminds me of, you know, C's candy. So how C's candy has that, um, you know, you might have like a, a creamy filling, caramel filling, and then you've got the protein coating around it. That reminds me of the structure of a virus, okay? So you've got your creamy filling, you've got your caramel in the middle. That's like the genetic core. And then it's protected by a layer of, um, well, dark chocolate. Let's just be honest, that's my favorite. So dark chocolate as the coating, as the capsid, okay? So the capsid uh, varies in structure. Now, a lot of times we use this word virion. So virion is a word we use for a single virus, okay? So the capsids here, consider the capsids in blue, okay? so here we're seeing two different types of capsid structure. We're seeing what's called the helical. On the right, we're seeing the helical virus capsid. So it looks sort of cylindrical shape. Now these capsids are made out of protein, and those capsids are made out of protein units we call capsomeres. So each one of these is a capsomere, and that composes the entire capsid. But that would be a helical shape or sort of a, a cylinder shape to the capsid structure. On the left, we have what we call the polyhedral virus. So the polyhedral virus has many uh, sides to it, sort of like a little um, geometric dome, okay? So it has all these multiple, multiple sides. So this is like little triangles, see that? So there's a triangle here and here and here and so forth. So this would be the polyhedral virus, also composed of these units we call capsomeres. And notice in this picture, they've cut away at it to show us the internal nucleic acid core. So what we're looking at on this slide are some different morphologies or shapes to the viral capsid. So on the far left, we see an example of a helical capsid. Now this is the tobacco mosaic virus, an example of a helical capsid. So the tobacco mosaic virus actually infects the tobacco plant. And I think it's important for you to know that viruses infect other cells besides human cells. So viruses are little infectious particles of nucleic acid that have been around since the dawn of time that know how to copy themselves inside of, inside of cells. And they invade plants, and they invade animals, and they invade bacteria, and they invade fungi. So every type of cell has some sort of viral particle that has co-evolved with it and attacks it specifically. Pictured in the middle of the slide, we see the human rhinovirus. And this is one of, the, one of the causes of the common cold. There are a number of different viruses that do cause the common cold. Rhinovirus is just one of those viruses. 
So the type of capsid that rhinovirus has is called icosahedral. Now, this is classified as polyhedral. So this would be polyhedral or many-sided. Mini, mini icosahedral literally means 20-sided. So remember all of these little triangles that make up the sides of these, um, these little geometric dome-shaped viral structures? Okay, so that's icosahedral. And then we have complex. Complex means that it has some other form to the capsid. So a good example of that here is a virus called bacteriophage. Now more on bacteriophage a little bit later. Okay, so one thing that all of these viruses have in common is that they are just the core of the, the genetic core plus a capsid. And we call all of these viruses naked. So what does it mean to be a naked virus? Well, a naked virus just means that the virus is composed of a genetic core, which we now know is composed of DNA or RNA, either double-stranded or single-stranded, plus the outer co covering we call the capsid, the protein capsid. Now, together, these two components, the core plus the capsid, we refer to that as the nucleocapsid. So a naked virus is just the nucleocapsid. So it's possible for some viruses to just have the nucleocapsid as their structure, and then it's possible for some viruses to be enveloped. So the envelope is actually a phospholipid bilayer, but it's a phospholipid bilayer that the virus did not make itself. It stole it. Who did it steal it from? The host cell it infected. So it stole this outer coating. We'll learn about when it steals it. It steals it in one of its very important life cycle stages called the release stage. So in the release stage, some viruses, not all, okay, not all, but some. So some viruses have this additional feature called the envelope, derived from the host membrane, um, it can be from the nuclear envelope or the cell membrane. Now, what's different from the cell membrane is that it, it also has viral spikes embedded in it. So these viral spikes in this picture are shown in green. The envelope is shown in yellow. The capsid is shown in blue. And then there's the nucleic acid in light blue. Okay, so the, we would say the capsid is helical, but it's surrounded by an, an envelope. So the helical would be a word we use to describe the capsid, but this particular virus in the picture is surrounded by an envelope with spikes, viral spikes. Also important to note, some viruses have additional structures like tail fibers or carry enzymes that the cell doesn't provide. What is the advantage of being an enveloped virus compared to a naked virus? Well, generally, an enveloped virus is more protected from the immune response because of that phospholipid bilayer that the cell recognizes as self even though there are the viral spikes, which can be an antigen that can stimulate the immune system, a lot of times enveloped viruses are hidden, at least for a longer um, period of time, and delay the immune response. Let's take a look at some enveloped viruses. Now, these are pictures taken now, we've got cartoon images, of course, on the right. And who is this? That's coronavirus. So that's coronavirus. 
And that's, of course, its cartoon picture. You know why it's called coronavirus, right? Because of the spikes, they look like a crown. And the word corona means crown. So, hence the name. Pictured on the left, we see coronavirus under the electron microscope. So the electron microscope is very powerful. It's also very expensive, but it can magnify images 100,000 times their actual size. So this is showing us the coronavirus at 100,000 X magnification. Do you remember what the magnification was on our microscopes in class for the bacteria labs? The highest magnification we have in the lab is 1,000x under oil immersion. That's the highest magnification we get. To, use, to see an electron microscope, you need to go to a research institution like the University of California, and they have some electron microscopes. Pictured below, this is HIV, another example of an enveloped virus. Okay, so this is these are all enveloped. That's what I'm trying to show you. These are enveloped. So coronavirus is enveloped. HIV is enveloped. And again, you can see little halos of spikes. HIV also has little halos of spikes around it. Today, though, I want to tell you the story of bacteriophage. Bacteriophage is an example of a complex virus. What that means is that the shape of the capsid is complex. Um, it's actually non-enveloped, so it has a complex capsid. And you can see in the picture, it almost looks like a little spider or like a little moon or lander guy. So he's got a polyhedral capsid head and inside there is where the viral genome is stored. But then he also has this structure here we call the sheath, and then multiple tail fibers that are used for attachment. Who do bacteriophages attack? So the word bacteriophage actually means bacterial eater. Bacteria eater. So yes, these are, these are viruses that invade bacterial cells. So they are very specific to the bacterial cells and even particular species of bacteria. And there are thousands of different bacteriophages and each bacteriophage is very well adapted to the, to the bacterial cell that it infects. Here in this picture, again taking, taken from an electron microscope, we see a bacteriophage like a little spider landing on the surface of a bacterial cell. So this would be here, this would be the cell surface. And this would, of course, be inside of a bacteria. Okay. And it, the little virus lands on the uh, exterior and, into, and, and then attacks the cell. So the reason why I like to tell you about bacteriophage is that there is a lot of interesting things we've learned from studying bacteriophage uh, historically as well as currently. So historically, understanding how viruses uh, um, attack cells was discovered in bacteria. So by studying bacteriophages, that is how scientists figured out that this, there is a step-by-step -step process that viruses use to attack their cells. So let's take a look at an animation that describes one of the life cycles of, of viruses. And this is a life cycle we call the lytic cycle. Some types of viruses called bacteriophages or bacteria eaters only infect bacterial cells. 
While phages can vary in their shape and genetic material, the most unique in this class is the head-tail morphology with double-stranded DNA. To begin the infection process, termed its life cycle, the phage first attaches to a bacterium. More specifically, proteins within the tail fibers bind to specific receptors on the surface. The tail then contracts, injecting the DNA inside the cytoplasm of the host and results in an empty capsid. To reproduce, one possibility is to enter the lytic cycle, a mode of replication that involves taking over the bacterium's cellular machinery, destroying the host DNA, and forcing it to produce viral components. The phage's DNA is protected and copied, and additional sets of proteins are synthesized to aid in forming new viruses. During this self-assembly phase, the viral genome is packaged inside the head. The phage even translates proteins that degrade the host's cell wall, allowing water to enter. As a result of the expansion, the cell bursts, and such lysis of the bacterium releases hundreds of new phages, which can now find and infect the population of bacteria nearby. So you just watched the video about the stages in the lytic cycle of a bacteriophage infection. And I wanted you to see that because, again, historically, this is how we learned what viruses do to cells. So here we're seeing the um, bacteriophage now. They left off the, the cool little tail fibers, so let's draw them in. So remember, this life cycle is called the lytic pathway. So what happens is the bacteriophage uh, binds to the surface of the cell and then injects its DNA. Now it's showing us the viral DNA in blue and the host cell DNA in purple. So it injects its DNA and then that causes the cell to use the viral DNA as instructions to make more virus. So that means the viral DNA will be transcribed and translated into viral proteins as well as that viral DNA will be copied by the host cell's own DNA polymerase. And it will make all of these copies of the virus. Remember, it's like hijacking the cell and it's telling the cell, guess what? We're not gonna make cell proteins anymore. We're gonna make viral proteins. I am in charge, says the virus. And it takes charge and converts the cell into a viral cloning factory so that we can get hundreds, even thousands of new viral progeny released from a single infected cell. Now here it's showing us in the process of release, this causes the cell to lyse or break open. That's why this cycle is called the lytic pathway. The word lytic means to break. So the outcome of this pathway is cell death or lysis. So like I said, this is how scientists figured out how viral infection occurs. This is also how scientists figured out that DNA is the genetic material. Now, these were from experiments in the 1950s. In the 1950s, the structure of DNA was um, determined to be double-stranded, a double-stranded double -stranded helix. But scientists debated for a long time what was the genetic material. In other words, what was being passed down that would give rise to new traits? Was it DNA or was it protein? Because when scientists would do experiments with cells, they would find a lot of both of those things. They'd find a lot of nucleic acid, and a lot of DNA, and they'd find a lot of protein, and they didn't know who directed the synthesis of who. So they did experiments with bacteriophage. And what they could do is they could label with certain um, colored dyes, and isotope dyes, they could label either the viral proteins or the viral nucleic acid. And they, then they could trace which, which uh, 
substance actually got into the cells and directed the synthesis of new viral proteins. And so they tried it both ways. They tried labeling the, the viral proteins. And if you just labeled the viral proteins, well, take a look. When this viral uh, bacteriophage lands on a new cell, the viral proteins stay on the outside, right? So this purple proteins, they stay on the outside. What gets inside is the viral DNA, right? All of this, this is the viral DNA. So the viral DNA gets inside and that can actually be uh, traced. Okay, so we could see that in experiments that would label, uh, fluorescently label the protein versus the DNA. So the protein stayed on the outside of the cell, the DNA got on the inside of the cell, and it's the DNA that directs the production of new proteins. Now that is a very um, important concept in biology. It's so important we call it the central dogma that DNA uh, is transcribed to mRNA and translated to protein. So that is how it was discovered. It was discovered using bacteriophage. Now it was also determined that there is a method of gene transfer that can be directed by bacteriophage between bacterial cells. Let me erase this red here. And let's talk about that for a minute. It's a method of gene transfer that we call transduction. And what happens in transduction is that sometimes bacterial DNA is transferred from one bacterial cell to another via a bacterial virus, a phage. So we call that process transduction. Okay, so it's a type of gene transfer. What we call horizontal gene transfer between bacterial cells. Remember we learned about two other types this semester. You remember what the other types of horizontal gene transfer are in bacteria? That's right, one we did, we actually both that we did as labs this semester. Transformation is another mechanism of horizontal gene transfer between bacterial cells when bacteria take up foreign DNA from their environment or can be artificially transformed by heat shock in genetic engineering. The other mechanism is conjugation. That is a method of direct horizontal gene transfer through the pilus structure. Some bacteria, remember the F plus cells, carry the pilus gene and can construct this uh, protein tube we call the pilus, connect bacterial cells, and essentially squirt DNA into a neighboring cell. So at that point in the semester, I held off telling you about transduction because most of you were just trying to wrap your heads around conjugation and transformation, right? So now those are memories of the past that you've conquered. And transduction is another mechanism, though, of transferring genes between bacterial cells, but it's via an intermediate structure called a bacteriophage. Now, this is actually fairly rare, but it does happen. What happens is that in the process of a bacteriophage infecting a virus, what happens sometimes is that rather than, usually what happens is, is this uh, bacterial DNA, which here, let's show it in purple again. So this is bacterial DNA in purple. So what happens is that this bacterial DNA normally gets uh, chopped up. So the bacterial DNA, it'll get chopped up in the cell and then usually just uh, digested by enzymes. 
what can happen is accidentally, if there's some chopped up, let's say here's some chopped up bacterial DNA in a cell, what can happen is that accidentally, sometimes, these phages that are being packaged over here, so let's go ahead and um, put some bacterial DNA in there in purple, okay? And let's go ahead and package one of these little, uh, one of these little uh, phages with some bacterial DNA in its capsid instead of viral DNA. Do you see that? So let's have one of those guys come out here. How about that? So he's gonna he's gonna come out here, and then we're gonna get one of these little phages with some bacterial DNA inside. Okay, so it's packaged with some bacterial DNA from this bacterial cell. And then this little guy, he comes along and he infects another cell, another bacterial cell. So we'll put another bacterial cell over here and we'll draw our little phage infecting. So of course he squirts his DNA into the cell but this is DNA that originated from this bacterial cell. Now this new cell here that just got infected, this is his chromosome, right? So this is his chromosome. So what can happen is that some of this bacterial DNA can get into this bacterial DNA, which came from Bacteria, we'll call this cell bacteria A, okay? So we'll call this cell A. So this is DNA from cell A that got packaged in accidentally into one of these little phage particles and then goes and, re goes and infects a new cell. And we're gonna call this cell over here, we're gonna call this cell B. See that? So now the DNA from cell A has transferred horizontally to cell B. Okay, so let's draw some of that DNA now incorporated into, so it's going to hybridize in here, into the chromosome of cell B. So cell B has acquired some genes from cell A, but through this indirect process called transduction. Okay. So that's another important thing to realize about bacteriophage is that it can accidentally transfer. Remember, that's what that's what we're talking about with horizontal gene transfer. How can we how can we pass DNA from neighboring cells from cell A to cell B? How can we pass DNA from cell A to cell B? That's what we mean by horizontal. And we learned that sometimes cell B can just pick up foreign DNA from the environment, and that's called transformation. Or sometimes cell A will build a pillow structure and connect itself to cell B, and that's conjugation. But now I'm telling you there's a third thing, transduction, which means that accidentally some of these viral particles get packaged up with chopped up DNA from cell A and passes that DNA to cell B. And then cell B acquires a trait from cell A. Okay, so a new trait from cell A. There's more. Bacteriophage also taught us about a second pathway that exists in the life cycle of viruses. So in the lytic pathway, the outcome is going to be cell death. The cell is going to be killed as a result of turning into a viral cloning factory. But there is another outcome, and that outcome is called lysogeny. It's also referred to as latency. But when we talk about how a bacteriophage can infect a bacterial cell and trigger lysogeny, we call it ly lysogenic cycle or lysogeny. Let's watch a short video about that process. When large numbers of bacteriophages are present, they can enter an alternative replication mode. 
the lysogenic cycle, where phages can reproduce without killing their host. This cycle begins much like the lytic cycle. The phage first attaches to the host cell and injects its DNA. However, once inside, the phage DNA recombines and integrates with the bacterial genome, forming a prophage. The prophage itself is not active and does not drive production of new phages. Rather, when the host cell divides, it's replicated along with the host DNA. So, we just learned in the little video you watched of a second type of cycle that certain viruses do. Please note that not all viruses do the lysogenic cycle, which I'm now going to show you here. So this is a second type of pathway that can occur. And it was first described in bacterial cells infected with bacteriophage. What happens is that when the virus infects the cell, rather than then causing a, a cycle that will ultimately kill the cell immediately, what happens is that the virus will integrate its DNA into the chromosome of the host cell. And when it does that, we call that prophage. Now, prophage is essentially dormant. So it's a essentially a dormant virus. And notice what happens. As the host cell replicates, it replicates the virus, the prophage, along with the cell. And this can go on and on and on for long periods of time until for a various numbers of reasons, it will suddenly go kick back into lytic cycle and will produce new virus. But in the lysogenic cycle, this, the virus is dormant and there's no new viruses made. Okay, so in the next few videos, we'll talk more about specifically human viruses.